Hello and welcome to another episode of Making Stuff Look Good in Unity. This is Particles 102. If you haven't seen Particles 101, don't worry about it. This video is actually going to be a better introduction to Unity's particle systems than that video, with explanations jammed full of images and stuff like in my newer videos. Quick caveat before we get started, I'm using Unity 5.2 and there were a couple changes in 5.3, mostly related to collisions and 3D rotations, which we aren't going to need today anyway. So if you see that my inspector looks a bit different than yours, that's why. Okay, that's it for housekeeping, let's make some stuff. Here we have 8 particle effects, ranging from the absolute most basic to some pretty interesting looking stylized effects. The differences are small changes of each system's properties. Properties of a particle system can roughly be split into two categories, properties at birth and properties over time. Let's start with a very simple particle system. This plain white glow isn't much to look at, but it's got quite a few different properties at work. We'll look at the main rollout in the inspector for this system. We have a duration set of 5 seconds, although this won't matter too much because we've also got the particle set to loop. This means after 5 seconds, our system will continue to simulate with various properties looping around to their values at time 0. We've got pre-warm enabled, this just means the system will simulate on awake so the player doesn't see a looping system's first few seconds. Without pre-warming your particle systems, depending on when the particles are loaded, the player might see a couple of awkward seconds while the system simulates through its very first loop. If you wanted to get that effect intentionally, you might leave pre-warm off and maybe even use a start delay to time when your system starts. Next on the list is the start lifetime. I've got it set to 2 here, which means a new particle will live for 2 seconds. Here we've got the start speed. Unlike the start lifetime, you'll notice it's got two numbers next to it. That's because instead of using a constant value, this property is marked as having a random value between two constants, meaning when a particle is born, it will randomly decide its starting speed between 0 and 1 units per second. That speed is applied along a direction. When there's no shape defined for the system, this speed is along the local positive z-axis. But in our case, we've got a circle shape defined. That circle is aligned with the z-axis, so the starting direction of particles will actually be a random direction in the local xy plane, multiplied by our random speed value. In the emission rollout, we have a rate of 10 and an emission based on time. This means the system should emit 10 particles per second, so we might expect to see the system spit out one particle every tenth of a second. Alright, we'll hit up the rest of these properties in the other examples, so for now, we're going to jump down to color over lifetime rollout. This property defines a gradient which will be sampled from over the particle's lifetime and multiplied by the start color of the particle. In this simple gradient, we define the color at the start as white with an alpha of 255, so completely opaque. At the end of the gradient, we have another key for the alpha component set to zero. This means that over the two second lifetime of a particle, it will interpolate its color from an opaque white particle to a completely invisible one. Lastly, we've got size over lifetime. Like color over lifetime, its value is sampled over the lifetime of the particle and multiplied by the particle's starting size. Our particles here have a start size of 1, so this curve actually maps the exact size of the particle over its 2 second lifetime. You can see we start at size 0 and smoothly approach a size of 1, and then taper off to 50% size at the end. Let's move over to the next particle and bring in some color. Surprisingly little has changed from the boring white particles to this system to make such a big difference. First, the starting size has been bumped up to 2. This is going to be multiplied against that size of our time curve, so now the particles should be twice as large as they were before. The big change here is the start color. We've defined a gradient for the color of a particle at birth. Don't be confused though, this isn't the particle's color over time. That is to say, each particle won't start red and then go over all the colors of the rainbow. This gradient only gets sampled once at birth instead of continuously over the life of each particle. An interjection, sir. With color over time, we use the normalized lifetime of a particle to sample the gradient. What time value is being used to sample a particle's color at birth? Good question. We mentioned the duration earlier and left it at its default value of 5. Well, it's a lot more important now. We'll sample the start color gradient using the normalized time of the entire system with the duration as the divisor. This means it will take 5 seconds of simulating the system to see the entire rainbow of colors. Also note that this rainbow gradient has red at the beginning and at the end. Because we're looping the system, it's a good idea to have this gradient be continuous to get a nice transition every 5 seconds instead of a more jarring color change. Moving on, the emission has been bumped up to 20 per second to make this system look more full. Now we'll hop down to the renderer rollout. 
There are several properties here that govern how a system renders relative to other objects in the scene. For now, I just want to draw attention to the sort mode. It indicates how particles will be sorted within a given system. The default option of none means unsorted. It won't look consistent from frame to frame or depending on what direction we're viewing the system from. For these particles, we're using youngest first. This means the youngest particles are drawn first and the oldest last. Oldest first does the opposite. By distance means they're ordered based on distance from the camera. In our case, by distance would be the same as unsorted because we're viewing the system in a 2D perspective and the particles aren't moving along the z-axis at all. I know we're going along pretty quickly, but let's keep this pace and dive right into the next system. For these particles, there are a couple of tweaks to size and emission, but the key difference is that this system looks a bit glowier than its counterpart. It's got the same starting color gradient as the previous system, but you'll notice that sometimes the color looks pure white towards the center, even though we don't have any pure white keys in the starting color gradient. This is because the particle is using a material other than the default one. Specifically, it's using a material with a shader that blends colors additively. Additively blended colors are exactly what they sound like. We take the source pixel color and we add that to whatever color is in the screen at the same pixel. Some hues happen to have the RGB components such that when several of them are blended over top of one another, they add to pure white. Additive blending is a great effect for things that should glow in your games, like lootable objects or magic spells. The new material is assigned in the renderer rollout, but you can also drag a material from the project panel onto the particle system in the hierarchy. Now that we're getting into using our own materials for particles, let's also switch up the default particle texture. Using a simple white circle is a great starting point for stylized particles. This system also introduces another property to experiment with, the gravity modifier. The gravity modifier is the multiplier with which gravity is applied to the particles. It's a nice tool to quickly make your systems feel more dynamic, as particles will move at varying speeds over their lifetime. In this next system, texture is showcased even more by having our circle use a thin black outline. We've also ramped up the emission and switched the render mode to oldest first. Moving on, this system uses square shaped particles. Unlike all the round particles we've been using so far, squares are very different in that it's obvious when they've been rotated. For these square particles, we set the start rotation to a random between two constants, 0 and 360. We also set a rotation over the lifetime, again with a random between two constants. This means that at birth, particles will be rotated randomly 360 degrees. They'll also randomly select a speed between negative 90 and 90, and then over the course of its life, it will rotate that many degrees per second. The key to all these systems so far has been experimentation, small changes one or two at a time to see what effects we can create. This next system has a couple small changes, like using random between constants for lifetime, so some particles will live longer than others, as well it uses random between two curves for the rotation speed over time, so that particles will rotate quickly on birth but slow down over time. But perhaps the biggest change in this system is in the emission module. We've taken the rate right down to zero, and instead added a burst of 30 particles at time zero. So what you're seeing is a burst every one second, with particles lasting between a half second and one and a half seconds. This means that a few particles from the previous burst will overlap with the next one. Last but not least, we have a system demonstrating the emission by distance property. This means that for every one unit the system moves, we should expect to see the system emit 10 particles, or one particle, for every tenth of a unit moved. Note that this will only work if the simulation space of the system has been set to world. I've attached this emitter as a child of another transform, with a script that rotates it over time. We can use this to test that regardless of how fast the system is moving, it emits the same number of particles over a given distance, whereas the density of particles would vary if it were using time-based emission. Holy shit, okay, I didn't expect when I started making these particles and writing the script for this episode, it would feel this dense. There's so much more to say about particle systems, but let's keep our heads from exploding and leave it here for today. I'll include all the textures, materials, and prefabs for these particles in a Unity package linked in the description. You're free to use all of them as is in your own projects, or better yet, use them as a baseline for making your own unique particle systems. Thank you all for watching. If you haven't seen my videos on shaders, check them out because eventually I'll be doing some crossover episodes where our particles and shaders work together to make some seriously awesome effects.